I see Boldy, Addison, and um, Rossi in the lineup next year. Done. Um, after that, you know, I still think they need three guys. Hmm. We're not going to sulk. Instead, we're leaning on positive Pat Micheletti, official butte to break down the wild season, which came to an end in game seven. Plus, now, who do we root for in the cup? Presented by Soda Stick, brought to you by Jim Beam, Better Edge, and State Farm Insurance agent Tony Hoagland. This is episode 74. Gear up with the hottest merch in the state, courtesy of SodaStick.com. Snag a throwback Tony Oliva hitting school tee to celebrate baseball season, or keep the hockey vibes year-round with a plethora of on-ice merch. Be sure you're staying tuned to our social channels for a chance at a $50 Soda Stick gift card giveaway. Bar Down Beauties at checkout will always get you that free shipping. Happy shopping. At Jim Beam, they know the importance of tradition, like chanting Let's Play Hockey prior to the start of each game, or playing the state of hockey anthem after a wild win. This season, raise one to your fan family with the bourbon that invites us all to come as friends and leave as family. Jim Beam Bourbon Whiskey, the official bourbon whiskey partner of the Minnesota Wild and XL Energy Center. Remember, drink smart. Jim Beam Kentucky Straight Bourbon Whiskey, 40% alcohol by volume, copyright 2021. James B. Beam Distilling Company, Incorporate Claremont, Kentucky. Buddy, I'm I sorry. Said, we're, gonna sulk. we're not gonna sulk just no, for one we're second. Not. Just for us. <laughs> this is why, because I'm gonna get on my soapbox one more time. I already did it on Twitter. <laughs> I was fine at Game Five. Yep. I was accepting of the fact that the Minnesota Wild season was probably <laughs> over. Game Five went in like, okay, this doesn't hurt so bad. I'm okay with this. This is, you know, whatever. Even Game Six, <laughs> they win. Game Six, I was like, you know what? I'm okay. It doesn't hurt so bad. Let's do this. After game six and they win, I'm like, oh, we're going. We're going yeah. see you, Colorado. Let's go <laughs> round two, baby. And I had so much regret. I was so mad at my heart for being like, we believe. And my head's like, no, you don't. You're stupid. It's a toxic relationship that I cannot yeah. break. It's very hurtful. I would tell anybody that was dating the Minnesota Wild to run <laughs> far, far away. Because Save yourself. It's, it's just, it hurts. But Minnesota I know, sports. It's, it's Minnesota, Minnesota sports. sports. Yeah. I know. I what if what do people like who don't follow are they happier that they probably they don't follow minnesota sports like they have i would to assume be. so yeah like they're not as don't have as many like cuts in their heart as we do well before but... game seven my uh i stopped over at my parents house like during the day um and uh my mom was like you know tonight's gonna be my mom's not like a sports person right like she watches them with my dad and i just because but like she's not a sports person and she was like well we should have fun either way because like the wild <laughs> made it to game seven i'm like mom that's loser talk now it's do or die like if they don't win she's I'm handing out bad. participation <laughs> trophies we're like yeah, no we're there. losers <laughs> yeah i was like no that's not how this is we are not gonna have fun if the wild lose i'm telling you that right now <laughs> it's not a good time i mean we have a lot to dive into obviously with the season coming to an end we again waited until after after game seven, so we're recording this to give you as fresh content as we can. Pat McAlady will join us to break down some more of the nuances that we saw during the series and of the Minnesota Wild. But Alexis and I obviously have a lot to unpack ourselves. <laughs> um, you know, now that we've had time to digest, it still really is a, a good season. Not to say, yeah. you know, not to hand out that participation trophy, <laughs> but it, there's a lot of positives. It feels different. It just has a different vibe to a first round exit. You know, I think Pat years past, it was like, Ugh, like this sucks. Like you guys aren't good. You're not looking forward to an off season. Mm -hmm. Whereas this year, it definitely feels like there's a lot of promise. You're excited about the future. It's probably going to be a fairly busy off season for mm -hmm. the Minnesota wild. There's a lot of things that they have to look at and navigate. Um, again, especially with that expansion draft coming up as well, but it's not as doom and gloom as years past, right, Alexis? Yeah, I know a lot of people laugh when Minnesota sports fans are like, oh, but we still had fun. We did a good job. And it's like, <laughs> yeah, it is kind of silly. But at the same time, it's looking at it at an analytical standpoint, too, where it's like this Minnesota Wilds team for sure overachieved in the regular season. Most people have them finishing like at the bottom of the standings or at the very least, like fighting for a playoff spot. Mm -hmm. The Wild secured a playoff spot, you know, a week and a half, two weeks before the um, postseason started. They battled hard all postseason. And yeah, they had some games where they did didn't look good. And that's, that's just the truth of it in the postseason. but they battled really hard down three, one to force a game seven. And they, they battled hard in game seven. Um, and they just weren't able to get one more win to send it the, their season to round two, but this Minnesota wild team 
when you look at what was expected of them this season and what they accomplished, this is something to be proud of because a lot of, I've said this before. I don't think the wild are in a rebuild. I think they're in a reshape. They didn't sell the farm. They didn't get rid of everything and start from scratch, but they made a lot of changes that really shook the foundation of this team. And when you do that, it sometimes takes a couple of years for you to be a, a, a playoff contender. And the wild somehow managed to have a very successful season this year. They were a fun team to watch. They were talked about by national media, which are the wild are usually not because they're a very like low key team. Even when they're good, they're how many times did you, pe- did you see or hear people say like, wow, they're not boring this year. Like shocked, right? Like that <laughs> yeah. seemed to be the consensus from the national brass. Yeah. Like, Hey, the wild are actually they're fun. fun. So take <laughs> yeah. that. That's another good grain of salt. It's, it is those positives, Alexis. Let's yep. pull those positives, right? And they've got a lot of pieces who are in their infancy in the NHL and with this Minnesota Wild team that are going to be fun to watch for years to come. And a lot of pieces that are going to be joining this team in the off season that are going to make them even better come next season. So is it disappointing that they couldn't get a first round playoff win? Yes, it hurts. It sucks. Like it's not fun. Um, and I would obviously much rather be talking about them going on to the second round than saying we had fun watching them this season. But uh, I don't think you can be disappointed with the way that the Minnesota wild played this season or finished this season. And like you said, Jesse, that's usually the attitude when the season ends is how could they possibly have lost? And I don't think wild fans feel that way this time around still hurts, but uh, definitely a different feeling to it than usual. And to play devil's advocate, Colorado Vegas could be a really, really fun series to watch too. I mean, Vegas might really give it to them. It won't be the Colorado St. Louis sweep that we (laughs) saw in the first round. Sorry, not sorry, blues fans. Uh, but no, I mean that, that, that could be a lot of fun. What would you say Alexis was kind of your, the best thing that you saw the wild do that maybe surprised you during this first round? I mean, what was, whether it was a player or a specific kind of mental mentality, what was kind of the highlight for you for the Minnesota wild in the playoffs, whether it led to, you know, success in winning that game or, or not. Um, I do think it was kind of the, the mental aspect that they brought to this playoff series, which a lot of times when they get into the playoffs, the minute they start to, to smell defeat, it's like they just throw in the towel and they just can't figure out a way to win. And the wild faced a lot of adversity in this, in this playoff series, um, partly to their own fault, partly things outside of their control. Um, and I criticize them a lot for not being able to rebound from that in, in certain instances. But at the end of the day, when you look at this overall series, the wild match Vegas's, you know, mental game better than anybody, I think. And you could tell the vibe on the ice, the wild were doing a good job of playing that game. They didn't always were, they weren't always able to match Vegas's skill in this playoff series. And even some of the games, the wild won. you're like, I don't know how they did it, but okay. Um, but that mental game, the wild were on top of that all series, and that's going to bode you well come playoff time. Uh, and even in the regular season. So I was really impressed with that. Um, and I was impressed with for the first time, the wild stars stepping up when we needed them to getting big plays when you needed them to a lot of times the wild have had tendencies to fall flat in those instances. And I go back to game six, when Kevin Fiala scored that playoff goal, the power play goal and back to game seven, where Kaprizov tied it up at two, um, you know, uh, in that, in that moment where, you know, the wild were battling back. So they had a lot of big moments and the wild don't always have that. So they did a lot of things, right. But there's also a lot of room for improvement too. What about you, Jesse? What impressed you? I mean, yeah, third periods, I think for sure, because for me, I, you know, I shut down like, oh, they're done, they're over, whatever, but they (laughs) consistently kept with it, Um, you know, going a step further. It was sticking to the game plan. I think I kind of criticized Dean Ebsen internally when we would ask him like, oh, well, so you guys didn't look great. What are you going to (laughs) change? And he refused to change anything, which can be somewhat frustrating because I think I'd argue, you know, again, you look at that second period, which was easily the worst thing of the playoffs for the wild. Yeah. Um, But you know, he stuck to his game plan and it worked. And like you had said, it's kind of overcoming that adversity. The guys truly believed in themselves, which is something that I haven't seen from this team. I know I had talked about the lack of culture in the room for the past, you know, two seasons we've had barred on beauties, even before that, before we had the podcast this year, they really were a team and a family. And I know it sounds trite and cliche, but there's something to that, right? I mean, Mm -hmm. you want to go out there and battle with the guys that you have. And again, that's probably why Dean Evson didn't make some of the dramatic changes we saw because they're a family and they're going to do this together and they have belief in themselves and they know what they can expect from each other. So, um, I would just say, yeah, sticking to their game plan and seeing it pay off was Mm -hmm. really exciting. And, you know, and seeing again, to speak more to the mental aspect you brought up, Alexis was just 
the guys never really seemed that down, which again, as right. a media person was a little frustrating. And I was like, give me some passion, man. <laughs> I need some passionate quotes for the story, but they, they knew what they had to do. So, I mean, I think God. that was truly, truly tremendous. So again, let's round of applause from the Minnesota wild Dean Epson, <laughs> everybody, uh, because it was, they made it a really fun season. Again, we realize not how you wanted to go out. You never want to <laughs> bow out early, but you made it there Mm -hmm. exceeding expectations, having a really great year, um, a lot to hold your head up about this, this season moving forward. And I'm excited even more so for next year with some moving pieces coming in. Alexis, who do we cheer for now for the Stanley cup? I mean, what are your odds? No offense. I'm sorry. I'm going to be honest. I never had the wild winning the Stanley cup this year anyway. Yeah. But who are you? My heart did. My brain did it. (laughs) (laughs) Who are you looking to, or who are you going to follow? And is it going to come from the West or the East, the cup winner? Easy answer. Toronto Maple Leafs. Go awesome. Matthews. Love you. Um, I, and I say this for a couple of reasons. You know, she's One. true to her brand, right? <laughs> like at least she knows she sticks to the brand constantly. Um, I always kind of end up cheering for the Toronto Maple Leafs in the playoffs. If the wild, uh, when the wild are done, or, you know, when the wild didn't make it a couple of years ago, um, just because I love moving over to the East coast after the wild are done. Cause I'm like, I can't pick anybody the wild play against, you know, regularly like that. hurts. Yeah. So I have to pick someone the wild don't see very often this year obviously they didn't see anybody in that division. So it's very easy to cheer for them. Um, But one of the other reasons that I really would love to see the Maple Leafs do something is because a lot of people were likening the Maple Leafs and the wild to each other this postseason, where Maple Leafs have have had a tough time getting out of that first round, even when they've had good seasons or talent on their roster. And um, obviously the Maple Leafs have more, you know, high skilled players on their roster than the Minnesota wild do right now, or at least more, um, veteran high skilled players. And, um, and so I would love to see them get out of this uh, first round against the Habs and make a playoff run because, uh, they've got, you know, a lot of good guys on that roster and I've been rooting for them for a while to make a deep run. So they finally avoided Boston early in the playoffs and uh, hopefully this is their chance to make something happen. What about you, Jesse? I mean, I don't hate Toronto. They're fine. They're good. (laughs) Austin Matthews, my USA hockey boy. That's cool. There we go. Marner, you know, I love him. Um, I always find myself cheering for the Islanders because I feel like the wild days always come in very underrated and they're always pretty solid. And there's so much Minnesota love on the New York Islanders. So naturally anytime that I can cheer for a team where I'm going to see the Stanley cup here and cover the cup in Minnesota, I'm all for. Um, So I really, really like the Islanders, but I also really love Carolina. And I think I've said this time and time again, too, for the past year or two, I just, I love the fun and the energy and the talent. I mean, they really have it all. And I love Rob Brian Moore as head coach. I think he's truly phenomenal in what he's doing in Carolina is special. So it's a toss up between those two. I really, really like those two. Um, And that's who I'd love to see claim the cup too, just based on that ethic, not based on just superstardom, right? I think there's always a little bit more. I love to see teams like that go ahead and do it. So either one of those I'd be happy with Isles first, just for the Minnesota flavor, go Brock Nelson and uh, the Carolina Hurricanes, just because they're pretty fun too, which actually they have Jake Gardner. So that would also bring a cup. Here See, I'm, well. I'm total Don Cherry when it comes to the, um, Carolina hurricanes. I'm Ooh. like, y'all are, you guys are doing too much. Just Come dial on. it back. You're doing too much. Loosen up, <laughs> loosen up. A that Sorry. surprises me actually. Yeah. That is I don't, very that seems surprising. like it would be my brand. Right. But it's yeah. just like, I, I, ever since they did those shenanigans after the, every time they won and like, stop, just stop. This is, it's too much for me. It's I mean, you much. almost think you have to do that in Carolina though. Right. Because it's, that's fair. It's a different fan base. You're trying to get fans, fans on board. Yep. basketball. I think that's, you know, part of what they have to do for that culture. So I love to see it. Um, no nope, excited for round two coming up. Naturally, we are going to do another round of beat the butte with better edge. That's B E T T O R edge.com where you get to try to beat me. I don't want to brag, but I <laughs> killed it in the first round. I think I was second place most of the time. Um, it's still ongoing. We still have a couple games, obviously, to get out here, but it was hard. I made it challenging for y'all. I told you I was going to make it challenging. I'm also very lucky. So I like to better that. to be lucky than it is to be good. Exactly. So be sure to check out betteredge.com and join our beat the butte. We had a lot of great interactions, some good social chats, and it's fun. You can win some money. If you toss down the code buttes, B E A U T S, you will get a free $10 at sign up to use either to enter that competition or to place a bet on whatever sports you would enjoy. So be sure to check out betteredge.com. Um, before we go, do you want to give a sad college hockey update in case you yeah. hadn't seen the Robert Morris University men's and women's programs are no longer. Um, unfortunately, let's say I feel like we've seen college programs just really drop yeah. lately again. And, you know, it, it's 
part of a, unfortunately the pandemic and Mm -hmm. financials, but the way that colleges seem to be going about announcing the cutbacks on programs has been atrocious. Yeah, it's uh, it's sad, first of all, because Robert Morris has produced a lot of really talented hockey players. So uh, at, in that aspect, it's tough to see a school who's had so much success with their with the players who've come through there. Sad to see them uh, bow out um, with their hockey teams. But yeah, it's 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 tough because it's like you feel for the schools who have to make these decisions, because like you said, a lot of it is because of things that have happened out of their control in the last year. Uh, but it's like I, I feel like they're they're not like you said, not really trying hard enough enough to, I don't even know, maybe like inform your teams or your coaches. Like the coaches had no idea this was coming. Like, I think there's a common courtesy that should be extended. They shouldn't be finding out with everyone else. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. So I don't know. It's, it's disappointing and it's tough because you've seen throughout this entire pandemic and as you know, teams and universities and organizations have had to take hits and cuts and make changes. Um, it stinks because I think it's, it's affecting the younger you know, um, generations of athletes more than it's affecting the pros because the pros can rebound easier from this kind of stuff than other organizations. Cause they have the money to do it. They're still taking hits. It's still hard. They still have to make these really tough decisions, but it's gonna, it's not going to affect them as long-term as you know, the, the youth athletes who missed out on playing so much. And now these college organizations who are having to cut back and make changes. Uh, we talked about Alabama Huntsville and what happened with them, you know, what was the mm-hmm. beginning of the summer we talked about this. So it's uh, it's affecting the younger athletes a lot more, which is going to have a ripple effect when they finally get old enough to play in the pros. You wonder what that's all going to look like, but uh, it really is unfortunate because they, they produced a lot of good hockey players at Robert Morris. Yeah. You know, hopefully things can get kind of sorted out, whether again, they can salvage the program or Mm -hmm. we see some other college hockey programs start up and and come on in because college hockey really is finally, I think getting bigger and people are starting to pay attention, especially with some of these NHL players doing so well, having played college hockey too. So it's been really huge. I'd love to see that side of the sport grow as always, you know, us We're we're (laughs) fighting the good fight. We want to see as much hockey as possible. So unfortunate for that program, but hopefully we can find some positives coming out of there. Speaking of positives, positive Pat Micheletti will join us right after the break. We're going to take a quick one. We'll be right back. (laughs) Want to rep some Bar Down Beauties merch? We've got you covered, literally. Whether you want to show that you're an official butte or that you do not, in fact, support Chirping Duluth, we've got it all. So make sure you check out Bar Down Beauties on Teespring. We're back joining us now, a man that really needs no introduction, especially on the Bar Down Beauties podcast, as he is a very official beaut, like an extra official beaut. I think you have been on more than anybody else. Mr. Pat McLeddy. That's a little round of applause. Good morning, ladies and Fred. (laughs) Good morning, Pat. How are you? How was fan line last night after (laughs) a uh, eliminating win, a decisive win for Vegas and Minnesota season now done? Well, you guys both know we have very, very passionate fans um, in the state who want their team to win. And, you know, there was disappointment, but I think an understanding, too, of where the team is and, you know, what they're doing, but a lot of optimism. I was going to say, I mean, that's kind of how I stepped away. I certainly was, was bummed. I was looking forward to a second round. This team had me believing that a second round was possible, um, but it felt different. It didn't feel as deflating of a loss or of an end of a season as it has in the past. Would you agree? Yeah. You know, um, you know, here's the deal. I think back to when I was on with you guys last summer and we were talking about who's going to be the goalie, (laughs) Um, you know, who's going to be number one, who's going to be number two, you know, and you know, there are so many unknowns and um, uh, you know, and I think if we would have talked right before the season, had started, you know, we probably would have said, yeah, you know, like a lot of other people going to battle for that fourth spot, you know, boy, it's going to be a battle. Can we get in? And, you know, this team overachieved and, you know, not, not, and, and I look at the year as a year of transformation in the sense that they have a winning attitude. Now Um, they have a different mindset they support each other, um, all the ingredients that lead you to believe this is going to be the norm. And um, do they have holes to fill? Of course. 
Um, but it's, it's a, it's a good start. How did you feel going into the playoffs? I know a lot of people would agree with you when we say that the wild overachieved in the regular season, Mm -hmm. but did that change your attitude entering the playoffs? Like, do you think the wild would have stood a better chance against Colorado? Do you think this was either team series to win or are you not surprised that the golden Knights ended up taking the wild down in seven games? Well, I'm glad they drew Vegas, uh, number one, because Vegas, I mean, they're a really good team. Let's let's not sugarcoat it here. They are very good. Um, but the only team that they struggled with was Minnesota. Hence, I thought, you know, I thought it was going to be a long series. And guess what? There was a there was a path for them to beat them. Mm-hmm. Um, potentially. We all, you know, we should all learn something from from this playoff is that the regular season is much, much different than, than the playoffs. You get hit every time you touch the puck. You get slashed. You, you know, the shooting lanes aren't quite as open. The passing lanes are shut down. Um, and, and so, you know, I, I think Vegas realized that in game seven, that's the way they have to play. Because in game six, it was how Minnesota had to play shut them down, not allow their D to get involved, um, you know, uh, apply hit for hit, um, you know, all protect the goaltender, mm-hmm. uh, you know, get great goaltending. They did. Uh, and, and Cam was great throughout the whole series. I'll tell you a funny story about a call we got last night that would blow your mind away. <laughs> um, but, but so, you know, they'll learn from this. They know what they have to do. Um, they need to get bigger on the back end. They need, you know, um, to get a little faster. They need to get bigger up, up front and with a little bit more skill. They need a centerman. You know, there's a lot to unpack, you guys. Um, mm-hmm. But, um, you know, that being said, that being said, right, um, um, they may take a step, and you may laugh, but they make it, may take a step backwards next year before they take the next jump. Meaning, I look, I look at Boldy jumping in. I look at Rossi jumping in. And I look at Addison jump, jumping in. Those will be three rookies that, in my opinion, you know, are going to take a little bit of time to get to understand the league and, and, and all that. They will all succeed, in, in my opinion. But it may take a little bit. Um, so we got to be patient. Right. You know, and I think you've kind of mentioned it there. I think this playoff series with Vegas, Vegas showed that they have that playoff experience. You were reminded Mm -hmm. that they've been here before and the Minnesota wild don't really even have many players on this year's squad that had had that experience or had, you know, quite, quite those pushes. So it was definitely interesting. And I would completely agree with you. I think that's why you maybe, again, you didn't see them rush to put Matt Boldy in because he's just not quite there yet. I mean, they wanted yeah. to have a little bit more of the veteran presence. Um, first, I want to hear about your Cam Talbot story from the caller before I ask my next question. Naturally. Well, we had a caller <laughs> ask if there were any goalies available. <laughs> and, and I, and I, you know, I, I just, I asked him back, are you talking a backup? Are you talking a starter? What do you, what do you what are you talking about here? Um, you know, one could argue Minnesota had the best one two tandem in the NHL for a long time. Mm-hmm. You know, maybe not at the end, uh, but it, it was. Um, if if there are any issues, goaltending wasn't one of them all year. Right. I mean, all year, and yeah. I think Kakinen, um will be a number one someday. He learned a lot under Talbot, you know, reading an article, um, uh, just how hard Cam Talbot works. And I think we had talked about, or I had mentioned to you guys, you know, I had seen Kakinen play a lot in Iowa. And um, he, had a, he had a hard time playing a lot of games in a row for a long period mm-hmm. of time because, of, you know, he got tired. Mm-hmm. And I think he learned what it takes to get his body ready and he will be, and he'll be, he'll be so much better next year, I think. And, you know, he's got the talent. So I think that bodes well. And he's a rookie. I mean, I think people forgot that because he performed so well when he needed to. It's like in this the is best his league first... in the world. <laughs> yes, like he, and it was phenomenal to see him step into that role at a time, a pivotal time that the Minnesota Wild needed him when Cam Talbot wasn't available. Um, on the goaltending situation, two questions for you, Pat. 
do you, I mean, obviously Cam Talbot, did he exceed your expectations? Cause I know certainly I had the bar kind of low. I wasn't completely confident in him. Did he exceed your expectations? And then the second part of that, who do you protect in the expansion draft? Do you protect <laughs> Capo Kakinen or do you protect Cam Talbot? Um, do they <laughs> get one? Yes. One goalie to protect. Mm-hmm. Um, well, I tell you one thing, uh, Seattle would, would pick K- uh, Kakinen up in a millisecond. Yeah. I, I, I believe that um, unless they have other plans for a more experienced guy. Um, I, you know, that one is a really, really tough, 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 tough question that they're going to have, you know, maybe they'll make a deal where, you know, they, they'll allow um, Seattle to take somebody else, you know, or whatever. Right. I, I, I don't know, you know, or that's, it, it, it's going to be, um, it's going to be a difficult one if, if that's the case. Mm-hmm. And what was the first one? <laughs> Cam Talbot, how much did he exceed your expectations? I mean, he certainly um, impressed me well, beyond what I thought. Did I want him as my number one when free agency started? No. You know, I wanted Markstrom. Um, but, you know, the price was, was too high. I always thought Cam Talbot was a good goalie. Mm-hmm. He was on terrible teams in Edmonton. Uh, no defense. And Calgary – they, you know, they're, they're messed up. And um, so <laughs> just simply put, they are messed <laughs> up, man. <laughs> they are, they, they don't, you know, they didn't have an identity. And yeah. um, so I, you know, it, just knowing what I knew about Talbot previously, um, you know, God, he, he turned out great. And I no, I didn't, I, I thought he was going to be fine. Well, what about a guy like uh, Zach Parisi, who obviously has struggled with his identity with this team um, yeah. all season and was scratched for the first couple of playoff games, gets put in and looks like he didn't even miss a beat. Is the same Zach Parisi we've seen in the playoffs for as long as he's been right. with this team. Uh, were you an advocate of putting him in uh, right off the bat in the playoffs? And once he finally did get in, were you surprised with the way he played? I'm going to answer it this way. Okay. Um, Okay, lot, lot, lot to go through. Here. <laughs> uh, you know, and and I'm. L- let's talk about a guy. His age, um, his stardom, because he's going to the Hall of Fame when he's done, no doubt about it. The U.S. But Hall of Fame or the Big Boy Hall of Fame? The the U.S. <laughs> the U.S. Hockey Hall of Fame. Uh, whether he gets you know enough recognition for the other one, I you know I don't know. Um, but, but I'll say this, if you're a general manager of a team and you are building a team and you want, uh, to play a certain style, um, and that style, um, um, well, that, that particular player and okay, we'll use Zach. Uh, what is Zach, right? Zach, um, was a top six forward forward four years and deserve it deservingly so um was he a top six player on this team no is your answer because you have fiala and you have kaprizov um and you have other parts so um does he fit in your bottom six well that all depends on what you want on your bottom Mm -hmm. six Okay, um, do you want him to be the same play, uh, the same type of player he was? Do you want him to be more of a checking forward? Do you, you know, uh, and and is that player who has had that much stardom going to be able to accept a role like that? And how is it going to affect the team? Um, uh, or do you want somebody in there that? okay, has not had the career that he has, but brings you something that is more relevant to the, um, to the, the way you want to play. And is he going to help contribute to winning? Mm -hmm. Now that is what is going to face them this summer. And uh, whether they believe going forward, he is a guy that we want to have on our team to win a Stanley cup. And it's really hard to talk about because you're, you're talking about a guy who um, has, you know, had a wonderful career. Um, 
you know, it's unfortunate that Father Time catches up with everybody. And this organization has shown that it is there to do one thing, and that is to win a Stanley Cup. Not to make the playoffs, not to get through, you know, um, get, uh, you know, just get through a, a one, round one. They are there to win it. And unfortunately, in this business, um, uh, when it comes to uh, owing somebody, that's out the, do out the door, out the window. It's hard to talk about. It's hard to accept. Imagine being a guy who, who, who was a superstar mm -hmm. in his day, being told that you're going to play a lesser role, mm -hmm. uh, that you're going to play seven to 10 minutes a night, that you are going to get the odd power play. Um, if he is okay with that and everyone is on the same page. And I said this two to three months ago when he got benched, mm -hmm. sit him down, talk to him, have an understanding and say, you know, is this something that you can accept? Um, we think you can play a role. Um, then go ahead with it. Apparently, you know, their, their communication is not great. Mm -hmm. And, um, they're going to have to figure it out one way or the other. Right. Um, so, you know, that it's kind of a sideways <laughs> way of answering the question, but that's the best I got. Right. No, I would agree. I mean, and I've kind of said it that same way, Pat, when, when approached with the situation, because everyone here loves Zach and you understand the sentiment for him to be playing at home. But then on the other side, you have to think of how embarrassing almost this is and how there is that ego, you know, that you're going to play. He's used to being a superstar, you know, Nick Bukestad, Nick Benino, they were okay playing lesser roles. They're okay being on the fourth line. And I yeah. think that was something right. that was so hard for Zach Parisi. He, you know, he just couldn't wrap his head around it. And I think, you know, he finally maybe got a little bit closer toward the end here, but I think even at, uh, in yesterday's post game, it was still very telling that he's still not quite happy with he's the way happy, things obviously no. ended. And, and you got to understand that. And, and for him and the organization, again, like you mentioned, that's going to have to be a top priority probably in the off season, right? What would you think happens? I mean, Zach seemed last night by all perception that he would be okay with moving on from the Minnesota wild. How do you see that playing out? Do you see it playing out as like a buyout? Do you see somebody taking on even a little bit of some of this contract? He still has four years left here in Minnesota, but at a hefty price, or do you see that looking at exposure to Seattle? What would that look like? Do you think? To me, um, uh, uh, the only solution I see is a buyout. Um, I don't think a team is going to take on that contract. Mm -hmm. So if you buy him out and you give him his right to go to another team, um, you, you do it because another team, and I don't know of a general manager in the league based on the current economic situation and knowing that we're probably going to have a flat cap mm -hmm. that is willing to take on that much of a, a, a salary cap hit. At, at $7 million. Mm -hmm. um, for a 36-year-old you know, or whatever. For a 36-year-old right? player. Yeah. Now, if, 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 if they come to the understanding of, you know, it, it, it's time to move on, then listen, he's going to get his money. Um, Minnesota's going to take a hit, uh, just the reality of it. Uh, at, at some point, they're going to take a, a, a hit, okay? Um, ideally, if you could you know, pass that contract along, contract along, and he can play another four years, oh, you're off the hook. Right. You know, like the, uh, you know, the likelihood of that happening is very, very slim. Mm -hmm. So um, if they do buy him out, um, then a team might say, you know what? Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll take, we'll take a crack at him and we'll pay him 3 million or whatever. Mm -hmm. I don't know, whatever, you know, yeah. whatever you can get. Right. Um, so, I, I think that would probably be the best scenario that mm -hmm. could happen. Um, you know, we're going to have to wait and see. I was going to say, I suppose I forgot option D. Does he stay with the wild? Do you think they can come to some sort of agreement or come to some sort of, you know, decision to move forward together? Do you see that at all being a possibility? Or do you think that with the way the things ended toward the end of the season, that it made it pretty clear there's a rift between the two and it, it's going to be tough to, to mend? 
Well, I think mature adults have the ability to work things out, you know, at least let's hope so. Um, and if that's the case, um, and, and you're up front with them, and, and he, he's okay with whatever role he's going to play. And let's not forget, we're, next year we're probably going to play a full year, right? Mm -hmm. And a lot of things happen during the year. There are injuries. Guess what? Tonight you're elevated to a second second roll line. You are gonna, you know, get the 15 minutes a night. That is, you know, that 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 likelihood is is probably going to happen because no one gets through a whole year without injuries. Mm -hmm. And so, but for the majority and the understanding of what the role could possibly be, um, if if the player's okay with that and he understands where he's at. And the team is okay with that. Yeah, I, you know, I have I, I have no issue bringing Zach back, but 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 consistently in a top six role or even a top nine role is a lot to ask mm -hmm. um, for the way that they want to go and where they got to get to. I mean, let's be honest. Um, uh, the, you know, we know we know that they have to get bigger, right? Especially on the wings. Um, you know, uh, you know, look at. I look at a guy like Jordan Greenway. I'm I'm very disappointed. I really am. Um, and maybe it's it's maybe I'm I'm jumping the gun a little bit here. Did he have a better year? No doubt. No doubt he had a better year. But you know what? Um, they expect more out of him. Mm -hmm. And we we do too. We look at him, the three of us, and we say, Why aren't you dominating <laughs> every night? You know? And um Especially when he acts night. like he's that player that should right. be dominating every night, then it's like, well, if we expect that from you, you need to do it, right? <laughs> right, right, and and um, and and you know that that's a decision that they're going to have to make on him this summer. You know, is he a guy that going forward, um, we think he still has maturity level that he's that it's going to pop into his head and he's going to get it, a la Eric Sinek, who was phenomenal mm -hmm. this year, right? But if I'm, okay, if I'm building a team, if, if I am, and I look at this team saying, uh-huh, Stanley Cup, um, I see uh, a third line, a third line, not a first line, of Erickson, Ekfolino, and whoever. And you know who I like there right now? I like, when, when they get good, Hartman on that right side. Did you Is leave Brady? Greenway out because you think Seattle, he's going to Seattle? <laughs> Yeah, you know, but but in reality, right? And then you, and then you get that Marco Rossi, who's your mm -hmm. second line center, who's skilled and you know, and a playmaker. And then you get you know potentially another center um, to to be that dynamic center. And then you got Eric Tanek, who no one wants to play against. <laughs> who, who who you know Marcus Foligno, no one wants to go near him. Um, and what he brings every single night, you know. If, 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 okay, let's get back to Greenway. I'm jumping all over here. <laughs> I was going to say, but, you just drove right by that comment. <laughs> like, all right, but, Pat. <laughs> yeah, but, but if you get, if, you, if, if, if I'm, if I'm the wild um, um, brass, I, I put together clips of Marcus Foligno on a nightly basis. And I say, Jordan Greenway, look, look at the passion, look at the intensity, look at the drive, uh, look at the will to win. Um, look at the will to dominate and and you watch him all summer and that's what you need to be and because you know what he's got a little bit more um potential on this on the skill side than marcus does but he you know <laughs> you know all day long i take marcus Foligno right now i want to ask you pat about someone we surprisingly have not talked about yet in this entire conversation kirill kaprizov oh. um what were your thoughts on him in this playoff series did he uh underachieve did he do what you expected uh did or do you think vegas just did a good job of of keeping him pretty quiet what are your thoughts on him every time he went on the ice he had a chance to score in my i mean he has a chance to score or make a play um i thought he was fine um i thought it was a good learning experience he, he'll know now, um, you know, look at his goal the other night, you know, mm -hmm. he got, he got in the open space. Um, he's going to learn how to do that. And, and I, and I, and I, I go back to uh, Nathan McKinnon, Landeskog, Rantanen, where were they three years ago? Right. We all thought, Oh my God, superstars. Yeah. 
but you know what? They didn't get through a playoff. Um, now they will, and now they have. Um, and I and I think Kaprizov will be better next year in the playoffs, and then the following year he'll be even better. Um, you know, listen, I he's he, he he's fabulous, and um, you know, may not have been great at times mm-hmm. um, in the playoffs, but. Uh, I got nothing bad. Nothing bad. I, I mean, it's I almost mean, like I, Kevin Fiala last year, right? Like where yeah, yeah. there was that adjustment. I mean, you saw him grow and do much better playing under pressure and being the shutdown guy. I mean, it helped that Kaprizov was also drawing some attention, but that's kind of what it reminded me of that. Yeah, okay, well, 100%, he's not sure used to that, right? hundred percent. Remember in the playoffs last year, mm-hmm. um, Fiala gets a big goal in game one, mm-hmm. um, uh, game two, game three, game four, game five. It was all right, I got to do this all by myself. Mm-hmm. And I'm, and I'm going to, and you know, he took bad penalties, got frustrated yeah. and, and that's growing. And he was, he was great in this playoff, you know, mm-hmm. you know, he had great, you know, he, he, he finally mm-hmm. scored, but before that, I, you know, I, I, you know, there was maybe one game um, where he wasn't great, but I, I tell you, you know, he, he's a player. Mm-hmm. How long do you lock him up for? You are Bill Guerin heading into the, yeah, I mean, do you, I mean, that's the preferred, right? Instead of just like a bridge contract, you want to look at getting him for as long as he's willing to stay. Yeah, both of them, you know, yeah. both of them. Um, like it or not, you need superstars on your team. And, you know, you look at the, the teams that win the cups, they have superstars and, uh, and uh, yeah, you need that, you need that ancillary uh, those those other big rugged guys who play it hard and play it tough, but yeah, I mean, the, you know, priority number one in, in you know Ek Felino and Kaprizov. Uh, you already got uh, Felino tied up. You got mm-hmm. Hartman tied up. You know, I mean, you're, Fiala, that, that's, you need to tie him up. Yeah, that's him. You know, yeah, yeah. and and so you do that, boy. Uh, you got Dumba. You know, you mm-hmm. got Spurgeon. You got a very good nucleus and. Um, you know, that that's positive. Mm -hmm. Before we let you go, obviously kind of final question that we talked about before last time you were on. And I think you said there were about maybe three players away from being true, true contenders, seeing how this team finished up in the regular season, seeing how they performed in the playoffs. Do you still agree? It's probably about three players and maybe five years, or what does the outlook look like for the Minnesota wild to be a true Stanley cup contender where people aren't surprised that (laughs) they've made it this far? Okay, like I said, I think they, they, they potentially, hopefully not, potentially may drop a little bit uh, before they go up. <clears throat> now, um, I see Boldy, Addison, and um, Rossi in the lineup next year. Done. Um, after that, you know, I still think they need three guys. Mm-hmm. Hmm. So you add hmm, six <laughs> total. Um, I think they need a rugged defenseman. I really do, um, or, or bigger, a bigger D. And, um, and you know, they're going to have to make decisions on a guy like Bukestead, a guy like mm-hmm. Benino, a guy like Greenway. You know, are they going to be part of it um, uh, going forward? Uh, those, are, those are questions. You know, Victor Rask probably won't be around. Um, fill the role, fill the void, not great. Um, you know, uh, they, he, our audience you know, is going to be so disappointed about that. I'm sure. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I know, you know, and, and you know what, but, but give him credit, you know, mm-hmm. I, I, he did what they asked of him mm-hmm. and, you know, um, you know, and, but, but going forward, is he a guy that's is going to get you to a cup? Probably not. Mm-hmm. So that's their mindset. I think is who are the guys that are going to get us to that next level and bring us there. And um, so um, you know, that's how I look at it. Um, and you know, we'll, we'll see, but, but the bottom line is, um, I'll go back to what I said originally, the mindset of the organization, the players have changed. They believe in each other. They have each other's backs. Um, they fought hard. They worked their, their butts off. Um, and you know, they just got beat by a little better team this time around. Could they have beaten them? Absolutely. But you know, um, so I, I think there's, uh, you know, a ton to be positive about positive Pat always coming through, <laughs> making sure that the wild fan base, I want you guys to know, I watch play. every one of your, um, podcasts. Oh, <laughs> thanks. So thanks Pat. And you guys You're do a best. wonderful job. 
Uh, you're intelligent, smart, and I'm I'm lucky to be on with you. Oh, oh, clip that out, that. Alexis. Push that out. <laughs> Pat Micheletti says we're some of the best. <laughs> yes. Well, we always love having you on. Plenty of off season to catch up. I'm sure we'll have you on plenty more times. We uh, yeah. adore uh, welcoming you as our official dude. Thanks for your insight as always. Thank you. Thank yes. you. Yes. Yeah, of course. We're All right, gonna you, take guys, a- you guys have a great day, okay? You too. We're going to take a All quick right. break. We'll be right back. Hey, guys. This is producer Fred. I just wanted to ask everyone to go out there and spread the word about Bar Down Beauties. Leave us a like, share, thumbs up, review, you name it, we want to hear from you. Find us on YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and of course, your favorite podcast app. We're back. Thanks again to Pat Micheletti, who has been on, honestly, like, what, five, ten times? I, th- I was going like to say, I think it's five. I think yeah. we're up to five. He's yeah. keeping he's keeping that leaderboard steady. He refuses <laughs> to be taken down by, like, Dane over there, who I think we've had on. He's times. creeping up on him, though. <laughs> he's getting there. He's getting there. No, we always appreciate Pat's takes. He'll be joining us plenty this offseason because I imagine it might be a little bit of a busy offseason. Yeah. I hope. I enjoy a busy offseason, certainly. So we will see. Segment three, up for debate. I have another gripe with you, Alexis, on the teams <laughs> that you selected for this Come week's on. up for debate. Uh, but you had selected the idea of best playoff team, right? That maybe right. obviously didn't make it because they haven't made it past the first round. But uh, <laughs> why did you select the teams that you did? And, um, yeah. <sighs> Because you know, know I, where I'm going with this. You know yes. I'm going to bring it back. Well, I'm going to agree with you because after I made it and like put it up, I was like, wait a second. I didn't even put the team in here that I would have picked. Like, I don't know what I was thinking. I think I made this really late at night, so that's probably what it was. Um, but I did the 2003 team who made it to the conference finals, the only conference finals appearance that the Minnesota Wild have in team history. Um, I did the 2014 team, I believe, against uh, when they um, had that playoff win against Colorado and then ended up losing in the second round. Um, and 2008, the, the year that they won the, um, division. So those were kind of the three teams I picked. Um, and then I ended up not even going with one of the teams that I selected. <laughs> Jesse, I'll let you air out your beef with me and go ahead. I, Cause I think you're going to say 2016, 17. Yeah. <laughs> Give them some damn respect. <laughs> no, I, I mean, ironically, that was the first year that I started covering, but that was the first time that I really felt like I do now where that yeah. team was special. I mean, the 2014 had the, those core of guys, 2016, 17, those guys had grown up and yep. they had gotten much better. And you saw so much promise out of Grandland and Nino Niederreiter and Charlie Coyle even, and everything was just freaking clicking for the wild that year. And it was so exciting to watch them all regular season that it was hard not to be hopeful for them to move on and continue. So 2016, 17 was great. I mean, again, that was an amazing year for me to join my NHL Mm -hmm. coverage. Um, but that's my team. And that's who I, I stand by that. That yeah. was the team that I thought this year again, maybe, but I mean, 2016, 17, has gotta be it for me. And that's what I ended up going with too. And I even kind of made a joke at myself on Twitter that I'm like, I don't know why I did include this in the graphic because this is who I would have picked. <laughs> um, the 2003 one, um, when you go back to that, I, I that team kind of reminds me of this team in the sense that they overachieved a lot. Sure. Like everyone was like, how, you know, that that we, they're so young, they're so new and they're surprising everybody. They're coming down three, one twice um, and they make the conference finals in their infancy. So in that sense, um, I think people were disappointed, but just because once they got to the playoffs, they achieved so much that the way they lost in the conference finals was extremely disappointing. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think 2016, 2017, and kind of my reasoning for it is the, they obviously swung for the fences on that late season, um, addition of Martin Hansel and Ryan white. And at the time I really defended them. I respected that they saw potential. Did you, did you like that trade? Team. You liked it? It, like the movie. looking back on it, it's the worst <laughs> trade of all time. But at the time, a lot of people were like, what are they doing? And I'm like, you know what? I respect that they see potential with this team and they're going for it. That's they, to me, it was just like, they just balled out. They were like, let's do it. Let's make a change here. Let's see if it's going to get us a, a long playoff run. And looking back on it, uh, I'm devastated <laughs> at how that went, because I, I, I don't want to say that's why they didn't achieve much in the playoffs, but looking back on it, I'm like, that's probably not uh, the best move for them to make there. And I don't really have any beef with Martin Hansel. Ryan White, though, was an atro- atrocious <laughs> addition to the Minnesota Wild roster. Um, but Never yeah, so, 
<laughs> so I think that's why that one was really disappointing for me, because like you said, there, there was a lot expected of them once they got to the playoffs and everybody was talking about how, you know, exciting and good this team was, and they just couldn't get it done. So I would have to agree with you hundred percent. 2016, 2017 was, was pretty disappointing uh, to see the way they bowed out in the playoffs. Yeah. I got nothing to add. That would be it. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's it. It was, I got to stop doing the up for debates at like midnight on Tuesday night. I got to <laughs> clear my mind and do them earlier in the day. <laughs> exactly. Well, that's going to do it for this week's episode. Again, be sure you check out cues with the Buttes. We've got even more questions to answer about this Minnesota wild season. We're not done. We're not going anywhere. You guys, we will make hockey relevant to you all summer long or most of the summer. We might, if maybe we can take do vacation. it during a damn pandemic, yes. we can do it in the off season. <laughs> exactly. So don't, uh, don't tune out. We're going to still bring you some really fun content, some really great guests. Uh, we will be out at the Hendrickson foundation event this coming Saturday, June 5th. If you are around Blaine or the sports center, be sure to come check it out, um, and support a really great cause. We were out there mm-hmm. last year. Things obviously looking a little bit different, uh, because of the pandemic, but be sure to swing on by say hi. If you see us mm-hmm. there or anywhere in public, we love to say hi again we'll we'll come to your live events and hang <laughs> please out <hire> us. <laughs> yeah please please hire us or just you know feed us too like i'll take yeah. free food whatever free food, drinks yeah free beer good. yeah <laughs> as always we got to give a shout out to uh our sponsors presented by sodastick.com don't forget bar down beauties will get you that free shipping always great new merch now let's shift into some twins gear they got some really cool stuff yeah. going on there they've got some good saint stuff i love the saint paul saints they got some throwbacks there so be sure to check out sodastick.com we'll have some new bar down beauties garb coming out this summer as as well. So stay tuned for that. Better edge, B E T T O R edge.com where you can bet on all of your favorite Minnesota teams or non Minnesota teams. There's <laughs> plenty more than, than just inside the state of hockey. Um, and again, beat the butte going on for round two. So be sure you come join me and, uh, chirp at me a little bit for that. That's always a fun one. Jim beam cheers to Jim beam as always. Alexis, what do you drink your Jim beam with? Um, well, after the wild loss straight up, honestly, yeah, <laughs> make it neat. <laughs> Fred, what about you? Uh, usually it's either in a Coke or straight on, the, on maybe on the rocks. On the yeah, rocks. Right. On the rocks. Let's yeah. That. Yeah. That's, yeah. A little dilution. Go. It's all right. Yeah. I'll drink it with anything once I can drink again. So like, that's good. <laughs> like, give me all the booze. It's fine. Baby um, dude doesn't like alcohol. <laughs> I know. Call me crazy. She's, <laughs> it's just a little nuts. But, uh, so thank you to Jim Beam and, uh, Tony Hoagland always. Appreciate that support as well. And Talk North for featuring us on their lovely network. Um, That's going to do it for this week. We'll be back again next week. Uh, Have a great one.